Well, good evening, everyone. I'm so glad you're here tonight. In our Bibles, we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and the majority of our time is going to be found in that good chapter. And so I encourage you to open your Bibles, or if you have it on a phone or tablet, however you're going to have the Word of God in front of you tonight, you need to be in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll be studying there in just a moment. I hope you had a wonderful day today. God gave us a beautiful day here in the Tampa Bay weather. Whether you were at school, whether you were at work, whether you did a lot of busy things, it's good to have you tonight. I'm glad that you're here, and I hope God blessed you today and that you enjoyed the day that God gave us. There are some who are visiting. So glad that you're here. Some wonderful friends I've known for a long time, and I'm so glad to see you and glad that you are here. And I'm glad we get to spend a night like tonight together. We are talking about everyday Christianity because our walk with Christ is not contained merely to a day, not to the first day of the week. But our walk with King Jesus is something that involves everyday decisions, everyday matters, or as for kids considering tonight, everyday relationships. I think one of my favorite strips from the Peanuts cartoon, it's very well known. It's when Linus says to his sister that he wants to be a doctor, and her response says, you a doctor? Ha, that's a big laugh. You could never be a doctor. You know why. Because you don't love mankind. That's why. And his response, I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. I think all of us kind of remember that, that famous little line. There's a little truth packaged in there. And we love our brethren, and we love those who God has woven into our lives. But sometimes, if we're just being honest, maintaining and sustaining the relationships that we have can be a challenge. I don't remember when he wrote this, but our brother Paul Earnhardt years ago wrote these words. He said, what we ought to long for is a theoretic spiritual world about which we could move purely, a world without any of the inconvenience and annoyance of people's foibles and other people's needs. There we would be free to praise the flawless God untroubled by all human imperfections, save our own, and avail a deep, tranquil piety. We could do marvelously well, we think, if the behavior of others didn't keep interfering with our own supercharged heavenly mindedness. Kind of get what he's saying? I'd be doing really good spiritually if it wasn't for everybody else. But he goes on and says, but such a spiritual world is a myth. And such piety is fiction. The church is not a monastery where we can find righteousness by retreat but a family where we can find joy in relationship. There is no true piety that does not deal rightly with other people. Life in Christ is a one another affair. It's beautifully written. When we obeyed the gospel, when we surrendered to King Jesus, not only did he put us in a reconciled, right, and close relationship with the Father, but he placed us into a deep and real relationship with all saved people. Paul would describe us as members of one another, but I like the language from 1 Peter 2 that, that we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. That's what I want us to think about tonight. The, the immense blessings, uh, the incredible opportunities, but also the responsibilities of belonging as God's people. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 4. These words are considered by most as some of the last words the apostle wrote. And what also makes them significant is that these are considered the last words he wrote to the young evangelist. So you imagine these are the last words. What is it that Paul is going to write to Timothy about? And the final words and the final letter are about people. Read it with me. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. Make every effort to come to me soon. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. And the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, 
Strengthen me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, but Trophimus I left sick at Miletus. Make every effort to come before, before winter. Eubulus greets you, also Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. It's obvious one of the things that Paul is weaving to the young preacher here is that there are some truths about people that Titus needed to understand. Truths about people. And it's all woven here in these simple verses. For instance, one of the things that he reveals is that some people disappoint. Verse 16, at my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. Even in the high expectation of defending the gospel, when counted upon, the brethren were not there. And there are times when we have great expectations. There are times when we really hope the brethren are going to be there for us, and yet there are times when, when they disappoint. I remember, uh, remember being a young preacher, the very first work, 20 years old. I was in southern Indiana, and we had a visiting preacher of well repute, and we were sitting at the lunch table, and our youngest member, a kindergarten girl, was sitting there at the table. And I had high expectations that she would sing my praise and let this man know how good she loved her preacher. And she said to this visiting preacher, you know, I, I wish that you preached here all the time. And I thought... And he said, well, I'm, I'm just afraid that I put people asleep when I preach. She said, don't you worry about that. Our preacher does it all the time. <laughs> Some disappoint. <laughs> Did you notice Paul's response? Even when the brethren in verse 16 disappointed, did not come to his defense at the gospel, did you notice what was not his prayer? He didn't say, may the Lord smite them for their ignorance. May the Lord answer them for their, for their inconsideration. No, he says, may it not be counted against them. You know why? Because if the Lord is going to count every disappointment against those who have disappointed me, there's going to be a lot that I'm going to be counted against, against all the ways I've disappointed, disappointed people in my life. All the times when it was expected that I would be there and I wasn't, or that I would speak up and, and, and I didn't, or that I would offer the kind word and that's not what came out. There's a good reminder here that while the Lord gave exactly what it is that we needed, very beginning, God saw that it was not good for man to be alone, and so God's answer to man's loneliness was people, specifically a mate, but, but he gave people. But I want you to notice even the best of people in our lives, our spouses, our children, our parents, our brethren, God's gift of people is not the same as God's gift of Jesus. People are not the Lord. They're not Jesus. They, they cannot fully satisfy us. They cannot perfectly be there for us every moment of every need. That's why in this answer, in this context, not only did he say that the brethren uh, did not stand by his side, but in verse 17, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. That is why Paul would say in Colossians that it is, it is Christ who truly defines who it is that I am and who it is I build my life upon. And so there are times when the people we love the most, lean on the, mo the most, disappoint us. He also pointed out here that there are some who try to hurt. He mentions in verse 14, a man named Alexander the coppersmith who did much harm. There are some who, for whatever reason, whether if it's selfishness or envy, just evil in their hearts or rebellion, they wield their words like weapons and they intend to hurt. They use the Word of God and pull up passages to beat and to judge others rather than to instruct and to guide. And Paul knew it well. But did you notice the difference? Those who disappointed him, Paul's prayer was, may it not be counted against them. But with Alexander the coppersmith, notice, it's very important in the times that we're disappointed, especially those when we are the target of oppression by people in our lives. His answer was, the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. He didn't say, I'm going to get even with him. Boy, just, just you wait. Just you wait till I see him. When the recipient of evil or guile or harm or hurt, Paul's answer is, I'm leaving that in the Lord's hands. So not that what Joseph said? 
Joseph, in response to his cowering brothers who had ruined his life when they were afraid he was going to enact revenge, simply said, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? Do I occupy the throne of heaven? Is it my right and my rule and my response to perfectly enact justice and what I believe is right and fair and every handling on earth? No, no, that's not my place. It's not my place to teach a lesson. It's not my place to make sure someone pays for what it is that they have done. I'm leaving that in the hands of the Lord. There are some who in our lives try to bring hurt and pain. But even greater still, that's not the most difficult passage or, or, or verse in this passage because he says that there are some from verse 10 that fall away. The real pain of verse 10 when he mentions Demas who had loved this present world and deserted him comes from realizing that Dem Demas was one numbered among the believers. In fact, Paul would describe him in Philippians chapter 2 as a, as a fellow worker. And there are many. I, I don't think there's a greater pain in all of us. Let's hear this. All of us at one point or another in our lives are going to have someone we know and we love and we care for so deeply and they started this journey so strong, and we have nothing but the greatest and the highest of expectations, and yet somewhere along the way, they leave it all. It could be for a lot of reasons. It could be for questions they never had answers for. It could be for harm they received from brethren, and they're taking it out on the Lord. It could be much like Demas, that they're distracted by things that are taking their pure devotion away, and yet we know this pain of those who choose to walk away from it, even knowing the truth. But here's the reality. If that is you tonight and you have someone you know and you love and you know that they are not where they ought to be, we never, ever stop praying for that soul. We never do. We never do. We continue to pray. We continue to reach. We continue to teach. We continue to try all that it is that we can to help this soul come back to King Jesus because... Some change for the better. And I really think that's the most beautiful thing of this whole section is that this one simple verse where he says in verse 11, Luke is with me, but he says, pick up Mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me for service. And again, that may not seem like much if we only look at the context here, but Mark has a big history with, with Paul. Because when Paul and Barnabas went on their first missionary journey, Mark went along too. And yet we get the commentary that somewhere along the way, for whatever reason, he quit and he went back home and he didn't complete what he started. So when Paul and Barnabas in Acts 15 are beginning to go on their second trip, Barnabas' idea is let's give Mark another chance. And Paul says, no way, no way. I mean, he didn't do it the first time. He didn't keep his word. Barnabas wanted to take Mark. Paul was so committed to not take Mark, they split ways. So what's it mean here? What are we to make of this commentary in verse 11 when Paul says that Mark is useful? Someone changed. Who changed in verse 11? Well, Mark changed. That it could be through time and patience and teaching, perhaps by Peter's counsel, as he's mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 5, this Mark grew and matured and became someone dependable. But it wasn't just that Mark changed. Brethren, Paul changed. Where before he only saw someone who made a mistake, only saw someone who deserted him. Now we see someone who can be given a chance to trust again. There is something that's so crucially important, not only for us to believe about ourselves, but in the vein of thought tonight, it's so important that we believe about one another. That if simply given time and grace and teaching and opportunity, my brethren will not stay where they are today. That if I simply am patient with them and help them by God's good grace and the help of those in their lives, they're only going to continue to grow and mature and to become something better than they possibly could be where they are today. We need to believe that. that is that not at the heart of what Paul would say about love in 1 Corinthians 13 when he says love believes all things? That even like Marx, when it seems like there's no way, there's no way this person would be useful. I have to believe that with the power of the gospel and the power of God and given time and opportunity, even the weakest among us can change and grow. And if I believe all things, brethren, if I truly, genuinely believe all things, that will lead me then to enduring all things. I'm going to be patient with you then. I'm going to be patient for your growth, patient for the immature seasons, 
I'm going to be patient through the rough season, realizing where they are today, just like where I am today, by God's good grace, is not where we're going to end. And then there are some who are true friends. The very end down there in verse, in verse 19, he says, Greet Prisca and Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila. Those who from the very first introduction in Acts 18, it says that he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked and they were tent makers by trade. They left from Rome, met Paul in Corinth. Immediately they had a connection through the gospel and their common trade of making tents and they had a lifelong friendship. From here, Paul would go on to Ephesus. Priscilla and Aquila went on to Ephesus. And all through the New Testament letters, we find Paul mentioning this special couple in fond ways. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 19, the churches of Asia send you greeting. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, send you a hearty greeting in the Lord. Or the wonderful statement about their work in Romans 16, where he says, Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Do you know what this is a picture of? There's a statement Jesus makes to the apostles about the depth of their sacrifice and leaving everything for him. And what he says is, everybody who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or farms for my name's sake shall receive many times of, as much and shall inherit eternal life. Do you realize what he is saying here? Do you know many, how many mothers I have? I mean, there was one who brought me into this world, but I have a lot of mothers in the kingdom of God who have loved me and cared for me and blessed me. I have countless fathers in the faith who have mentored me and taught me and blessed me all along the way. I have three, I have two brothers and a sister in the flesh, but I have a lot of brothers and a lot of sisters who would do anything for me and I for them. What would we do without this special family, good brethren? Can, can you see the point of what Paul is saying to Timothy? Can you see how that might apply to us today? I want you to get a good glimpse at people because these people are in your life, and brethren, these people are in our lives. These people are right here right now. They're among us. This is God's people. And the reason this is so important is because as he began the letter, he had something to say about Timothy. And what he's saying about Timothy had everything to do with his relationship with these brethren. Go back to the very beginning, 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. He said, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. She was saying, there's going to come some, Timothy, and before you know it, they're not going to want to listen. They're not going to stomach the truth. That's a literal phrase. Our youngest is eight months. A few months ago, we thought, you know, let's try and introduce some new food to this baby. And so when we put that first scoop of some blended food into her mouth, it wasn't disgust. Her face was pretty much disappointment was what I read. As in, why did you think this is something I would enjoy that you were plunging into my mouth? She cannot stomach that blended up Gerber baby food. And Paul says, there are some who can't stomach the truth. Oh, they love love and grace. They love harmony and unity. But all that stuff about Bible authority and sound doctrine, all that about the church, the purpose of the church and the work of the church and the function of the church, I, I don't have any time for that. I want you to notice what he says in verse 5. Notice specifically how it begins because this makes all the difference. And Paul's charge to Timothy. He says they're going to turn aside. They're not going to listen to the truth. Notice how it begins. But as for you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You see what he's saying? There are some among you, Timothy, some of your people, and they're not going to want to have any room for the truth in their life anymore. 
but not you. That won't speak of you. That won't describe you. You are going to live different. You're going to be different from them. Brethren, this is something that Paul has done all through his letters to Timothy. Go back to the first Timothy, first Timothy chapter, chapter four. Notice how he's done this before. First Timothy chapter four. The chapter opens, first Timothy four, beginning in verse one, it says, but the spirit explicitly says, that in the later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocates abstaining from food which God has created to be gratefully shared, shared in by those who believe and know the truth. He says, watch out. There are some who even in your times are going to turn away and walk away from this truth and are going to try by their own intention and motives to leave others away. Look at verse 12. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. There are some even in your midst who might be even despising you, looking down on you simply because you're young, but not you. That this won't qualify or describe you. No, you are going to live and speak and behave in such a way that the way you live would silence any criticism that would come from those across your lips. Go over to chapter 6 of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, he does the same thing. 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says in verse 9, he says, but those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. You see what he's saying? Timothy, you're going to have people in your life and they're going to get it all mixed up. They're going to build their lives all about here and now and material goods and wealth. They're going to lose sight of God. They're not going to be generous. They're not going to be thankful. But that's not going to be you. You're going to be different. Your aim, your pursuit, your life is going to be towards things of a greater, more eternal worth and value. One more. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, much like what he's already written in the first letter. In 2 Timothy 3, it begins in verse 1 by saying, but realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self and lovers of money and boastful and arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, brutal haters of good. Maybe just to summarize all of that, he says in verse 13 that evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Look at verse 14. You, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of knowing from whom you've learned them. Do, do, do you see what Paul has been saying all along the way? You may not always have the best example in front of you. You might not have had the most godly example in the home. You might not have always had the most noble example from a generation older than you. But here's the thing. Bad behavior doesn't justify a bad response. Just because my boss is rude doesn't mean I get to be rude in response. Just because my neighbor is ugly does not mean that I get to be ugly and sling it back at him. Just because tonight some people may be really rude and crass and loud on Facebook does not mean I have the right to just sling it right back tonight. Just because brethren may choose to be judgmental and harsh and crude at times does not mean I get to respond and, and, and like. What Paul is saying is, be different. Be different. You be different. And if I don't have the great example in front of me, if it wasn't at the home, if it's not in the church, if it's not in my life, what he's saying is, then you be the example. You do it. You don't have someone mirroring that for you? The brethren in your life are, are, are walking away from the things that you have taught them and led them? Then, Timothy, you do what is right. You pursue what is right. You set the example. You continue in the things you know that are true. Oh, good brethren, all my young friends, even if there are those right now in college 
And maybe those in my dorm, maybe those in my classes are not making the right choices or making the right pursuits. But as for you, even if I stand alone, even if there's no one else who would listen, but as for you, you then set the mold, provide the example, and do what is right. And there's another reason why this is so important, because right at the heart in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul brings in himself. Not only does Timothy need to understand his relationship with the brethren, but he needs to understand his relationship to the older generation. Paul makes it very clear in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 6, that he realized his time was soon, soon at hand. He was going to be going on the trip to Rome, and he realized, he realized being at Rome, soon to stand before Caesar, where his journey was headed. He said that I've already been poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And the future there is laid up for me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. He says, I know. I know where I'm going. It's obvious where my life is headed, Timothy. That's why you have to know these things. But I don't know if you caught it right down in the last section in verse 13. He has a request of Timothy. And what he asks of Timothy is what every older generation needs and can ask and require of the younger. You look at it again, verse 13 of our context. He says, when you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. When the body is cold, we need clothing. We provide service, care, comfort, and compassion to those who are hurting in the older times of life. When the mind is bored, we need books. Continuing to learn and to grow, continuing to study, continuing on even to the very end. My, my dad has preached for 40 years, and he has decided, as of recently, he's starting to pare down his library. And so times when I go back up to Indiana, I'll start to go through and begin to take the journey of having some of his books in my library. But there are still some times I'll go on the shelf and I'll start to grab a book. And he goes, hey, stop. I'm not done with that one yet. Because he's still learning and he's still growing. There's more he wants to understand. There's more work he has yet to do. When the Spirit is hungry, we need Scripture. There are many who believe the parchments to be exactly that. I need the Word. I need a younger generation to spend time and to read to me the Word, to share with me the Word, to preach to me the Word, to help me see and remind myself of the promises, the precious words spoken by Jesus. And when the soul is lonely, we need companionship. Cards are nice. Emails are thoughtful, but there is nothing that compares to being in present, face to face. There's two realities that come out of this. One, for every older Christian, I'm not going to put an age on that. You can just kind of think about it for yourself. But for every older Christian, there is simply no retirement in the kingdom of God. That's not how it works. In corporate America, you work to a certain age, and then when you're done, we need those who are younger and fresh and full of zeal, and we bring them in, and we shuffle those who are older out. But that's not how it works in the kingdom. That's not how it works in a congregation. Good brethren, we, we need to get this. We so often put great emphasis on our youth, and we love our youth, and we spend time with our youth, and they are precious to us. But the strength of a congregation is not its youth. The zeal of a church is its youth. The fire and the passion they can bring, reigniting life, but the strength of a congregation is its age, its wisdom. Those who have walked with God for years, there's no retirement. Things may look a little different. Your service may change, and the way that you serve may change, but you are absolutely, crucially important to the need, not only in this congregation, but in the kingdom at broad. We, we, we need your wisdom, we need your teaching. We need your example. We need your kindness. You can't retire and you can't quit. There's simply so much more needed for you even now. The second truth is a bit crippling. I don't know if you caught it or not, but Paul says something three times in these few verses that concludes this chapter. Verse 9, he says, Make every effort to come to me soon. In verse 13, he says, when you come, bring the cloak. And in verse 21, he says, make every effort to come before winter. 
Three times he's pleading with them, please come. My younger brothers and sisters, we're only going to have this older generation for a season. We're only going to have them for a time. Don't wait until it's too late. Don't wait till it's winter to reach out and to learn something from a generation who's come before us. Don't wait until it's winter to express our love and compassion for those who have, who have plowed, play, uh, plowed road for us that we ourselves are walking and traveling. Don't wait until it's winter to do a good deed for those who have come on before us. Don't, don't wait until it's too late to lock arms with those who are older, to learn and to grow and to serve side by side. My mentor and companion back home, Ricky Jenkins, wrote this not long ago. He said, yes, we are just people. We ought to strive to be like God in our hearts, character, and behavior, but also give people latitude to be flawed. No one will ever meet the expectation of perfection. Robert Turner also said, if you expect perfection or nothing, you will get nothing. Let people be people. Let them develop. Give them the time to change. Give them time to grow. They don't have to be me. After all, someone somewhere extended God's mercy to me. Do you know what he's saying? And you know what the heart of all this is about? What Paul is saying to Timothy, and brethren, what we need a strong reminder of is they're, they're just people. We're just people. We are a people who need patience. We are a people who need grace. We are people who need teaching, a lot of teaching. But we are people who need love, and compassion. We're people who need time. We're people who need people. And we're people who need Jesus. Now, this thought allows us to come to an application that I thought would fit so well with this congregation. So I want you just to end right here with me because thinking about people and our relationships puts our mind on something that fits so well with this good congregation. There are two groups of, of people who exist in this good church. You have such a great diversity of those who have walked with the Lord along obedience in the same direction for many, many years. And then we have some who are young, who are still in the early years of their life and the early years of their faith. And together you stand as one in this congregation. Let me just, if I can, say a few words about your precious relationship one with another. To those of you who may find yourself in the older years of life, again, I would, I would so strongly encourage you, we need you so much today. We need your voice and we need your encouragement. Think back, if you can, to when you were in your youth and those who were older who blessed you. What kindness did you receive? What messages meant the most to you? How did those who helped you and instruct you and care for you, with what tone did they speak? With what kindness did they care? For whatever you received and whatever benefit, shower that on us because we are ready to receive it. We need your love and your compassion and your example. For all who are younger, really the call for both sides, for those who are younger and older, the call of what Paul is pointing to in, in 2 Timothy 4 is the golden, the golden verse from our Lord Jesus who says, treat others the way you want to be treated. It's hard to think of it that way, but, but if you will, just for a moment, if you'll kind of go there with me, if the Lord allows and we live long enough, have you thought about it from that perspective? If I reach an older age and there's a generation that comes on after me, I would hope that we would get along real well. My wife and I were talking about the work at Kimball Road. When I came on at Kimball Road, I was 33 years old. Ricky was 63 years old. My birthday had come, and my wife said, you know, if this continues on and you're here as long as Ricky, your partner in this work was just born. I said, I don't like him already. <laughs> I really hope that by God's grace, when we get older, that we and the younger generations will be friends. I really hope that the generation coming on after us won't feel that our time has come and our sun is set, but that they will honor our work and our commitment. 
They'll be thankful for what it is that we try to do to the best of our ability. And that they won't see us as a nuisance or in the way, but that they'll see us as still valuable and useful and needed in the work. I really hope that the generation that comes on after ours will want to spend time with us and listen to our stories. That they'll ask us for wisdom and instruction and genuinely listen when it is that we try and talk with them. I really hope that the generation that comes on after us that they'll be serious about their faith. That they won't be flippant or casual with the word of God. That they won't be indifferent about this church and cause us so much concern and worry about this local congregation. Instead, I hope that the generation coming on after us will be the most vibrant and zealous and faithful generation we've seen yet. I hope that they will be so true and faithful to God and that they will be inspiring to us and bringing in a new life of things that maybe, maybe we needed and that we haven't had in a long time. I really hope for the generation that comes on after us that they'll make our departure easy, that when it's our time to leave, we'll have no fear about the generation we are leaving behind, but we'll have all the confidence that the Lord's good work his magnificent kingdom will continue. If that's what I want, that must be what I give. All too soon. The generation who has led us and brought us and taught us will be with the Lord. And those of us who occupy the younger years of our life will be those who are older, living with a generation yet to come. It's not a fearful thing, good brethren. It's a blessed thing. What a beautiful gift God gave us with this family with this precious, precious people. I told you on Sunday about Benjamin and home and heaven and that devotional and how touching and emotional it was. I had another one with, with my daughter, Emma. I want you to know I have a lot of stories about Emma. I love Emma very, very much. She just keeps life very colorful and unique most, most days. We had a devotional about heaven, and we were talking about God's wonderful home. We talked about what it will be like to be with him and to live there. And she started getting teary. And I said, are you excited about going to heaven? And she said, no, I just want to stay in Texas. <laughs> That's hard to understand, isn't it? You know what got her, though? I said, I understand. I love our home. <laughs> and I love our house. And I love our dog. And I love our street. And I love our friends. But baby girl, your mom and I want to go to heaven. And if we're there, don't you want to be there too? And her response is, well, if that's where you are, I guess I'll go too. Brethren, if that's where you are, my wonderful, faithful brothers and sisters, that's exactly where it is I want to be too. God bless you. Thank you for the way you love one another. Thank you for your care, my older saints, to the next generation. And thank you, my younger brothers and sisters, for your genuine faith and zeal. May God bless us as a family to be one who goes to home together. If you're not ready to be received with the Lord when he comes, if you are not prepared for that perfect home that he has prepared for each one of us, tonight is a night and the opportunity to make that change. Right here, right, ha right now, tonight, that as we are singing this song, if you need someone to pray for you and to talk with you, if you need to begin your journey by putting on Christ in baptism, turning from your sin, confessing him as Lord, right here, right now, tonight, we can make that change. If we can help you, if we can pray for you, if we can be a strength and an encouragement to you, right here's where you need to be. Let's do it right now as we stand and as we sing.